Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is John August. It is my great, great pleasure to welcome you to this WGF event. We are here talking with the legendary Eric Roth. Um, Eric, I've, we've crossed paths a few times. We haven't really had a good long chat. And so I'm excited yeah. that we're going to have a good yeah. long chat here on Zoom in front of 500 to 800 uh, people watching us. So we are in our respective homes. Um, but yeah. just for folks who maybe don't know your, your credits offhand, I'm going to read just a shortened list of some of your credits. Um, Forrest Gump, The Postman, The Horse Whisperer, The Insider, Ali, Munich, The Good Shepherd, Lucky You, Curious Case of Benjamin Button, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, Ellis, A Star is Born, The Upcoming Dune, The Upcoming Killers of the Flower Moon, Producer on Mank. There's so much to talk about uh, with you, um, but thank you for being here. Thank it's you. a pleasure I, to I see you. I you did this. I, I said to you earlier, um, they sent me a list of people who could moderate it, and I don't really know you that well, and I thought, well, he's a talented guy. Why not talk to you, you know? I love that. Oh, it, it. Uh, so I'm excited to get into this. And usually in one of these things, we would start back at the beginning about how you've got Interton screenwriting and, and all that stuff. And we'd spend about 20 minutes getting you up to something like the present time and then start talking about the things we should talk about. So I'm going to do it the opposite way. So right. I'd love to talk about what your, your writing process is like, what you're working on, how you work in October 2020 as we're recording this. Um, what does your daily writing life look like? Yeah, my, my writing life's really been, uh, hasn't varied since I gave up the typewriter, which wasn't as long ago as you might think, because I'm really a Luddite. Um, I still work, um, uh, and I've talked about this a lot, so if anybody's bored with it, they can tell me, but uh, I still work on a DOS program. I have two computers, uh, and I, I, I think half superstition and half kind of fear of uh, uh, not being able to learn Final Draft or something. Um, it was a program called Movie Master that actually is what they formulated a uh, uh, final draft from. Uh, the problem with it is that after like 40 pages, it runs out of memory. So you've <laughs> got to make sure you're at, it's about what an act break, you know? Yeah. And so I use that. Um, with the, I can't do anything with the internet on that computer. That's just solely for work, which is good. And um, I still have to print out everything and I can't email on it. So uh, I, I, the, the problem starts to become when, if you're getting lucky and somebody's gonna do the movie, they, they end up having, it's on their computer with Final Draft and uh, creating the, the real document. Um, other than that, I start at like um, eight in the morning every day. I mean, I always use the example of John Cheever um, who uh, um, would, uh, uh, He'd go to work every day, take the train in from Long Island in, in his nice suit and a hat. And he'd go and he worked in a basement in New York City in Manhattan, Midtown. And um, he'd take off his pants and he'd take his shirt off, work in his t-shirt and his underwear. Uh, 12 o'clock, he'd get, uh, get dressed again, go have a martini lunch, come back, work till four or five o'clock, uh, get dressed again and go take the train home. So it was like a job, you know, and a great job for him and better than anybody probably. And uh, and I feel the same way. I'm very, I'm pretty disciplined. Um, I, I do, uh, I don't do as many hours as John Cheever, but uh, come one o'clock, I mean, if I've done four or five hours and uh, that's about all creatively I feel I can do. And then I'll work again at night. Mm -hmm. I'll start around 10 o'clock and if I'm going good, I'll go as late as I can go. If not, I'll just do an hour or so and go to bed. And then I'll, if I'm really crunched, I get up really early, like three or four in the morning and see as, as much I can do. Um, uh, I leave plenty of time. I like to bet the horses, so that's my afternoons a lot. Um, right. I have uh, too many children and too many grandchildren, so I spend a lot of time as I, if I could, with the, aside from the COVID. Um, and um, I'm a blessed human being. I mean, I've been lucky enough to be able to. Uh, I think I think the biggest thing that I taught myself, and I, it's obviously have to be successful to do it, but that I tried to pick, and I've been wrong many, many times, but projects I felt would somehow enhance my, my, my own self, number one, and two, some kind of legacy that I wasn't just writing things for pay, which is a nice thing too, but uh, if I could have a choice, why not something I really cared about? Because uh, I believe uh, wholeheartedly in that passion is a, you know, two thirds of the game and the other third is this kind of bastardized art form we do, which is really a craft of a kind, you know, and I think you can be a great craftsman, I'm not sure. If you're an artist as a screenwriter, but that's a whole different conversation. 
there's there's so many threads I want to pursue off of this. I'm going to start at the at the most recent one, which is the degree to which a screenwriter, a successful screenwriter like you are, is largely there's an aspect of stock picking. So because you have your choice of projects you could work on, projects you're initiating yourself, things you get offered, and there's a decision process about which ones you're going to pursue. So it sounds like you're trying to pick projects that challenge you, that sort of you know. Are they the ones that scare you a little bit? Are they the ones that you like? You know, you can do it. Like, wh what is the decision process? Is it about who else is involved? In a, I think in a more intellectual way, I try to pick things that the themes interest me, and then what are who are the people involved and the characters? And I've done, I've done a, a number of adaptations. People think I've probably done more than I really have, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, I I mean, even things like Benjamin Button was just uh, a bad F. Scott Fitzgerald short story. If, possibility he was wrote, wrote something that was bad but uh, but of course the idea was a guy aging backwards and I never came mm -hmm. up with that one but um, the theme of that I said well that's interesting to me um, Elvis Mitchell if you know who he is uh, oh, yeah. the uh, critic, yeah. critic from the New York Times and he does a, a an NPR show he's a wonderful man and he said that he felt that uh, and it sort of stopped me because I thought it was kind of accurate um, and I'm jumping my mind works this way but uh, uh, that my films are about loneliness. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, I guess somehow, and then he started talk, talking about it. And I mean, maybe you can make that case and maybe you can't, but it struck, it, it resonated with me. I think there's some truth to it in that. So maybe I pick out themes that have to do with uh, some melancholic kind of quality, you know, and, and, and something about loneliness, you know. Um, I guess part I think sometimes of it, it, I think part of yeah. it is that I, I just to, to say a little more of this about me really um I didn't I've never had my own room my whole life so uh I, I guess I, I don't know if I need that I mean I live with my brothers and my brothers and then I um my brother I mean and then I you know I, I went to college and uh lived with I had roommates and, and I got married very young and, and then I you know etc so maybe that's part of it this desire to have human contact nearby i, I get very uh kind of funky in a hotel room even you know, alone at night so uh it's not that i do anything that exciting but that uh, it just uh, i get too aware of everything i guess now you, you can chart some of that that fear of loneliness over the course of like the 15 movies that i listed but talk to me about the movies that i, I didn't list because i i'm sure over the course of your career there's at least as many movies that you spent, you know, a tremendous amount of time on, you worked your ass off on that don't exist. And to what degree do those movies still stick with you? The scripts that you wrote that are not reflected well, in your, your bio? Um, well, I'll tell you one thing. I, I'm very lucky that my batting average is pretty great. Um, so I don't have that many. Um, I regret they never made a movie that Brad Pitt, it was actually Brad Pitt's idea, Hatfield McCoy, that I mm -hmm. think is a really good script that, um, I told him eventually so I'm going to do this and Kevin Costner did it on television very successful and I like that very much because it was like about um, what con why that that feud was kind of very interesting because there was no difference between the people it wasn't like you know uh, like the Hutus and the Tutsis or um, where there was some religious differences between the Jews and there you know what I'm saying and these people all yeah. came from the same place but anyway it was interesting it, it came down to the the coal companies paid one group for the coal that was under their land because there's a lot of coal in one area and not the other. Uh, so that was one. Um, I wrote a big space thing that probably, I don't know if it's worthy of getting made, uh, but it was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. The idea was that three um, prehistoric men were taken, three, yeah, they were triplets, I guess, were taken to another uh, galaxy. And mm -hmm. they're like sponges, you know. Um, I'm trying to think what. Yeah, I, I could I could see a low I could see a loneliness to that. I could see yeah, that, that, that it feels like it fits into the Eric Roth canon of loneliness. Yeah. Matt, uh, Hatfield McCoy. I guess you made that. I, I mean, the main character is lonely, so that one worked. Okay. Um, what else? Uh, I have to really think now. I mean, it's not that there aren't others. I just somehow they're escaping me. Um, I don't know why. Maybe it's just uh, age here, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure. There, there's probably I, I've had like. Just bragging, I guess, like twenty-five movies made, and uh, yeah. you know, and you know, some of them I think are better than others, and some are my fault, and some are other people's fault. Um, and um, I think I've had maybe like seven that didn't get done. You know, in other words, that that's amazing. That's, that's, I was really that's remarkable. That amateur. Yeah. Well, I think 
I think I, I started slipping as the business changed in the sense of that I was able to write kind of the movie star driven movies to, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And then as that changed, you know, as movie stars became too common, um, that there was a, there was a change in of course. And so I think those became, uh, stars born is kind of important to me because of, uh, it, it reestablished for me that I could still do this in a way, not that I had a question mark, but I think it, there were a few things that kind of lagged in, in the, in the interim. Mm -hmm. you know? And so that, um, I, 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 I'm sure there'll be others that come to me that didn't get done. You know, this is more, it's, it's, it's a, there's a few, but, yeah. um, and you know, and there's a few I wish didn't get done. So uh, we we won't make you name the ones you didn't, you you didn't get done. I have no problem. I'll, I'll tell you a very quick story. That, tell, tell me, uh, tell me which one. Yeah, so this one some. people enjoy. So uh, I I wrote a movie called The Postman right early on. Mm -hmm. and I wrote it for Tom Hanks, and uh, a whole bevy of directors were going to do it. Dick Donner and uh, um, I'm trying to think who else. I mean, good directors, and uh, you know, it was supposed to be a satire, sort of Swifty and uh, look at uh, uh, post-apocalypse idea was supposed to be after a nuclear war, a man who delivers the mail, et cetera, et cetera. And it was, it was very tongue in cheek, but I thought it was kind of a, a good satire. And, and then a um, number of years passed and Kevin Costner hooked on to it and uh, went and about, he made it. And uh, during the making of it, the uh, writer, um, Brian Helgeland is a wonderful writer who did Mystic River. And he also, he won an Oscar and a uh, really talented man. Uh, he had done the rewrite and he called me and he said, what do you want to do? Uh, do you want your, he's very generous. You want your name on this? What do you want to do? Uh, you want to dispute credit? Whatever you want to do. And I said, let me check. And I asked my agent, I said, what do you think? And she happened to represent Kevin Costner and said, oh, you got to put your name on it. I've seen the daily. This movie's amazing. I said, really? I said, okay. And, yeah. All right. I'll take my credit. And the movie won a Razzie. That's one of the worst movies ever made. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara gave us a Razzie. So it was pretty, it was pretty great. <laughs> Well, let's, I, I want to get into sort of the, the profession and sort of like this idea of, of rewriting and being rewritten and rewriting other people because we've both done a lot of that. And I think, I think we can clear up some misconceptions about that. Um, but I want to get back to a little bit more of the daily work that you're doing because um, you certainly treat your writing like a job. It's not sort of a thing you occasionally do. You, you treat it very seriously. You said you're at your desk at eight in the morning. Um, you're, there's a a scene for you to write. What is your first step in approaching a scene that you're writing on a day? Well, I think um, if are I, you I'd go, uh, outlining? What, what are you doing? Well, I, I go a step further. I, I always, uh, you know, if it's an adaptation. I end up underlining the book, and I find I underline the whole book. You know, so then you say, <laughs> well, where do I begin? Um, I'm not huge on outlines. Um, I know, mm -hmm. and I think every one of my movies has had the same truth that I. So the first scene has never changed once I figured out what it was in the end scene. The only one I can remember is in Munich, Stephen switched it to be at the World Trade Center for a good reason. Um, it was in a different location, but the scene was basically the same. Um, the, but the middle, middle is this great big adventure, you know, so I don't know what it yeah. is. And it's, it's obviously a little more uh, concise if there's a book, um, but if it's sort of more original writing, no matter if there's a book or not, then I... Is sort of that's what the journey is for me. So uh, when I start a day, um, assuming I've gotten through the first two or three scenes, uh, when I hopefully when I leave the computer, uh, I know the next two or three scenes what I'm going to write the next day. Mm -hmm. and that makes me feel very good. I can sleep at night. If I don't, it makes me a little anxious. And um, then I'll be talk to me about what, when you say you know the next two or three scenes. You, well, I know, you know like, in a general uh, sense, like what's going to happen or, or how. Yeah, you know, I know what's going to happen. I know where the characters are going. Um, that doesn't mean it works out always, but the, their lead, the characters lead me then. And as long as I can stay with, as I say, the theme, which is what's so important to me. Um, like, for instance, I'm doing this little thriller right now with uh, for Oscar Isaac and uh, Ben Stiller that I think is quite good. It's from uh, Joe Nesbo, uh, who's a Swedish uh, mystery writer. He's pretty terrific. Uh, short story. Um, and it's an oddball story. Um, and um, I, I, it needs me to keep figuring out where they're going to go next, because it's not a chase per se, but it is a kind of in that English style of strangers on a train kind of thing. And um, so I know, for instance, that I, I know the next I know the next scenes in Paris in a hotel. Um, I know what happens there. I know they have to then figure out how to get to a sort of a farmhouse. So, and I know what happens at the farmhouse because I figured out that he does something deceptive. So 
I know those three, so I'm hoping when I get there, I'll know what the next three are. You know, I know where I know the trajectory of it, though. I know what yeah, the, ending of the right. script is. I mean, so um, I, I'm on my track now. This one's a little bit a little trickier because I tried to um, be a little probably. I think it ended up being a more more clever than half. I tried to make it a little more um, postmodern, kind of like adaptation or something. And I'm still mm -hmm. with that, but I, I had to tone it way down. So. This one I've actually had to rewrite quite a few times. Uh, the one thing I do do, and I recommend- Can I stop for one second? You say rewrite a few times. So this is as you're still doing the first draft, you're, you're making big yeah, changes? Yeah, I, I, I okay. start on page one every day. Um, okay, so, I, you do, so you are yeah. that kind of class. Yeah. Like go back to the, and, and read through what you've written. I read everything I've written and I make little, uh, you know, whatever comments, uh, fix grammar, spelling, whatever else in it makes me go through another process, you know, and mm -hmm. makes me more familiar with it. And um, they do say that if you're going to spend your time doing that, you don't give as much time to the ending because mathematically, if you're running out of time you know, at some point. Um, so I do that. But, so let's talk, but let's talk, but let's talk about the, the first new scene you're working on. So you're talking about like, so the scene that's happening in a Paris hotel room, you know, sitting down basically what needs to happen in that scene, but yeah. what is your process in terms of figuring out, you know, Who's going to say what? What? What's the action in the scene? Like how it's going to unfold? Is that just a sitting and thinking thing for you, or is that a, on the keys? On no, the, that's more of a. Kind of I think it's a little more intuitive. Um, I'll mm -hmm. give you an example that um, I'm doing this thing for HBO, uh, uh, um, a uh, TV show that Alex Gibney is going to direct with Laura Dern, and it's a six parter. I'm just doing the first episode, and um, it's about a. Um, a true story about a woman who's a psychiatrist and her job is to interview serial killers and recommend to the court whether they're sane or, or, in, or insane to be executed. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I just, I, I'm, I've sort of just begun, but now I'm coming to the interrogation of the first, the guy that becomes our least character in the first episode. And I hadn't, except for basic stuff I wanted to get out where I, he asked her questions, where'd you go to school? I mean, it's sort of expository stuff that's just bad writing, but, um, I just started writing dialogue between them, you know, and, I, and so uh, some of it works, some of it doesn't, but I, 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 I just sort of feel my way and, uh, and I'm pretty good at it. I mean, I, I think I, I, I try to write, um, I try to write a little off topic. I think the subtext is much more important than textual. So uh, that's, that's, a, that's a thing I've had to learn over the years and it's not something that I think you, you just give it unless you're just such a wonderful writer that the best writing is not talking about what's going on, you know? Um, and so I know in this one, I'm just trying, what's it going to sound like between this serial killer who mm -hmm. killed like nine people and, and her, you know? And so try to keep it human, humorous of some kind, and also get as much information we can get out of it. So, but I, I think it's, yeah, I just, I just dive in and I've always done that. So it's not a matter of just self-confidence from being successful. I think it just, and I, and I, I embarrass myself by, sort of saying the dialogue out loud. <laughs> I'm like the worst actor <laughs> who ever lived because everybody's voice sounds exactly the same, you know, which does remind me, I mean, as a rule that you want to, um, uh, the, as we're talking about process, uh, have everybody's character be something unique and sound different. And I, I, this came to me in a way, even though I think I knew it somehow instinctively from being just, I like literature, so I read a lot. Um, that Michael Cimino, if you remember that director, um, uh, Michael and I were doing a movie and he uh, uh, had rewritten a movie called um, one with Mickey Rourke, uh, the dragon, uh, the year of the dragon it was, it was okay, but um, it was by the guy, same guy who wrote Silence of the Lambs, but um, he, he had given Mickey Rourke a wallet that had all the characters full life, like pictures of him in Vietnam and with children and driver's license. I don't, I'm sure Mickey Rourke never looked at it, but it spoke to the fact he had to know that person inside and out psychologically. And that's how I feel as a writer that you have to do that. You have to know every one of your characters, complete lives, you know? Um, so I try that, you know, not always successful, but I try. So in saying that you know, need to know your characters, complete lives, are you do, are you writing that down or are you just spending time thinking about that? Like how much of that, uh, that bio work is something that a person could actually read versus just stuff you are thinking I never, about I never, no, I don't write it down. I mean, except for little scribbles, you know, I mean, I just, uh, like in this, in this, um, thriller, I decided that she was going to be a, uh, cause I thought it was clever that she was going to be like Jillian Flynn, like uh, someone who wrote Gone mm -hmm. Girl. So 
So she's an author, which I think is interesting because then it makes you wonder whether this whole thing's just a tale that she's spinning, you know? Yeah. So then I could start figuring, well, how old is she? And, you know, you go through it and then what are her, uh, you know, neuroses, like, uh, I'll give something a little bit away, but like in the Laura Dern one, I have her being like, because she's always stressed because of these horrible people she's, you know, dealing with. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to try to make her like a kleptomaniac. And I just want to see if sure. it works, you know? So what does that say? And then what does that say about your relationship? Because her child then becomes a kleptomaniac. You know, that's what I want to try. I probably shouldn't say this too loud because it's giving away something, but uh, it's just interesting to me, you know? And so I don't think I'm wrong. I may be not right, but, uh, uh, but maybe that is a question. I, I've always think I've done that though, that I just said to hell with it. You know, let's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. get old and go down like the same bridge. Um, I don't, uh, I don't mind trying things that are a little bit uh, out, of, out of the norm, you know? Um, so, uh, now, you, you described this Laura Dern project, there's the, the Ben Stiller thing. Um, you have, it seems like you're working on a bunch of things simultaneously. How many things are, how many different projects are underneath your fingers? At I, point? This is unhappily because I'm not really, it, 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 do, it, it makes me very anxious. But I, I sort of, I do have them stacked up, which is, uh, you know, nice for me. Congratulations. But uh, it just happened to be they dovetailed. And sometimes that happens. And the good news is like, um, I spent four years on, or five years on this book, The Killers of the Flower Moon, which everybody should read. It's a wonderful book. And it's not my screenplay, I think, was accurate to the book. But it was the book and the story of uh, very quickly, Osage Indians, 1821, 1921, I mean, poorest people in America and discover oil in this terrible land in Oklahoma they've been driven to. And, and then every killer in America comes to, they kill 184 of them and to, for their money. And then this really heroic guy comes in. But um, so that's still, you know, that's supposed to start, um, uh, that's supposed to start um, uh, filming and, you know, once the COVID clears out and it's Marty Scorsese and, uh, in March. So I have yeah. that. So there'll be continuing rewrites with that. Leonardo wanted some things changed that we argued about and he won half of them, I won half of them. And uh, um, so that's happening. And then these other two are, uh, you know, as a work that's ongoing. And then there's some older ones that pop up and I have to then address, which is just a, a, a factor of having been lucky enough to have a lot of work and some things are just dragging like we had this whole situation that's developed with Cleopatra. I had done like seven drafts of Cleopatra at that point for um, uh, for um, uh, Angelina, and it became a big mess with uh, the hack at Sony and Scott Rudin and this and that. And uh, now there's a project was announced uh, the other day that Patty Jenkins is going to do one with Gail Gadot and um, and a, a very good writer named Lita. I forget her last name. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, and so I'm debating whether this is going to be worth me racing with them. And probably not, but, uh, yeah, but I mean, yeah, words, that's an old project. In other words, I yeah. had on it for five years or something. So, but I think, look, that's a function of some luck. Some uh, people, you know, have given me the opportunity and, and, and obviously success, I've been successful at it, which, uh, uh, sometimes is by design. And a lot of it is not, you know, um, it's just, uh, yeah. Can we talk about rewrites? So talk about sort of the rewrites that you go through in terms of getting the project up to, you know, to the point where you're happy with it. And then the rewrite process after you're happy with it to get other people, you know, happy with it. So well, I, I mean, when I'm done, uh, I, I, when I feel it's done, I'm done. And then I'll turn mm -hmm. it in. Um, I don't like turning it in just to a producer. I'll usually try to go around them and turn into the studio at the same time if I can. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we get the notes, you know, and then you, you know, you have, I, I have rules about notes and I can now, because I have enough cachet, I can say you cannot, you, I only give me, hear it. only give me bullet points. I say, okay. would you consider this character doing that? Would you consider, I mean, I don't like when they write these ridiculous essays on showing how clever they are with the notes, you know, and obviously if I did something stupid, it wasn't my intention to write something stupid, you know, so, uh, that's notes. Um, so then I'll begin to rewrite and rewrites hard for me because I don't, um, I, I think I'm more of an instinctive writer. So then I'm lucky enough to have work with some really great directors um, who some who are writers of their own. And that's easy in some respects because they don't 
they they get it. Um, and we can work it out together. Like Michael Mann, he's a, a very tough guy, but it's hard to work with and for the right reasons. But he's a writer so that we would battle things out. But he knew if I didn't quite have it, he could, you know, we could feel the direction. Well, on the other hand, um, who can I think of? Uh, Robert Redford was a little more difficult um, because he wasn't a born writer. So he wanted to really prove, he wanted to prove things. Um, uh, Marty Scorsese and David Finch are very different people, but uh, phenomenal. Uh, Marty is the most uh, willing to have you be inventive and he'll figure out mm -hmm. how to film it and if he thinks it works. And he's very generous if he doesn't think it works. You know, he said, let's try it this way, you know. And David, on the other hand, is very, very specific very literal in a great way and as smart as a whip and um, really fights you to get to where you want. He says, I want you to tell me what you're trying to articulate. Um, so he just has a different way of doing things. Um, and they both end up in different places. Their movies look different and they're different people, but uh, they're both incredible experiences, which is incredibly rewarding and which will just give me the time that I have a movie coming out called Mank uh, with, that I pro uh, produce with David and, uh, his father wrote and we worked on the script to make, hopefully bring it up to where it's uh, really great. And, but it's his father's script. And uh, it's about Herman Mankiewicz's uh, writing of Citizen Kane and his world with Marion Davies and uh, William Randolph Hearst and uh, Orson Welles. And it's a, I think it's an incredible movie. I mean, I'm, I'm tooting trumpets here, but uh, it's black and white. It's, uh, it's as skilled as David Fincher can be, I think. And it's, uh, it's I think it's probably limited for, uh, appeal to people because it's such a, a, a narrow subject, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a masterwork, I think, because uh, of David's uh, abilities. Um, and uh, I suspect, you know, its appeal is exactly the folks who are listening to this Zoom right now, because uh, it is about a, a, a writer's relationship with a director and a, and a visionary film that may not, may or may not come into being based on sort yes, of I mean, I think, how, I think how one, people do the yeah, stuff. I think one of the reasons David brought me on was because I, I've been, sort of an insider in Hollywood in that way for many, many years I've had, you know, I've worked with everybody from Kurosawa through Spielberg through whoever. And so I've had many relationships with many uh, writers, directors, actors, and I mean, directors and actors. And um, uh, so I know, I know the process. I know what's wounding about it. So when he asked me, what does it feel like to feel like you're not going to get credit or, you know, um, I could, I can write that, you know, I know what yeah. that feels like, you know, so it's a real experience. Yeah. Well, to talk us through that. So talk us through, you know, advice for writers who are dealing with a director for the first time and what those initial conversations are like. How do you feel out a director and sort of understand what that relationship is going to be like in that first meeting? Because I've been through some of them and I've come in with assumptions. Sometimes I've been right. Sometimes I've been wrong. Uh, sometimes it's gone well. Sometimes it's gone really, really poorly. What advice can you offer to folks who are well, listening about yeah, that I mean first conversation? Well, let me, I, I want to talk about sort of earlier in my career, because I think it's a little different now because I'm kind of, sure. cocky. I'm a little cocky now. You're, you're a legend. Not a legend, it's so funny. Uh, but I could come in and, you know, I can back up things. I, you know, I say this, you might want to press with. Early on, I did, uh, this is just a good a story. And it's not apocryphal, it's true. Uh, There's a director named Stuart Rosenberg who had done, done uh, Cool Hand Luke. And he was kind of a very good Hollywood rec and a nice man. And I was really young. I mean, I was 19 when I, I did, went down and rewrote The Drowning Pool uh, in Louisiana. And then I was on Onion Field with him. And Onion Field ended up getting made by a man named Harold Becker. And it's, a, it's an interesting movie. Um, but um, Stuart and I fought for like two weeks over one particular scene. Um, and I thought it was a great scene and he didn't think it was so great. And he finally said to me, and this, this just always stuck with me that you can leave it in the script, but I'm not going to shoot it. So that was the end of that conversation. And that was the truth. So that at the end of the day, if the director is not going to be flexible, you are stuck, you know, so you better try to find a way to be as best communal as you can be and also make the scene as good as possible. So you have to find, I think, and I'm not, sometimes I'm good at it, so I'm not, I'm not as good, another way to do the scene, you know, or another way to tell that piece of drama if that's what you need to do. So, um, and each director approached it differently. Um, uh, uh, I could, I mean, you have to ask me about each director and I could tell you how they all, uh, but each was, was very different, amenable to a point, And yet I, I get very, mm -hmm. I get very stringent if I think that they're varying from what the piece is about. And then I think 
uh, I've been lucky because the people I've worked with, I mean, in the main are really good directors. I mean, it's also something I don't think I could do. I mean, I tried when I was younger. I actually won some awards with shorts, but I always felt like this isn't me. I always, I thought I'd, if I went on to direct, I'd be like a B minus director. And what was the point mm -hmm. of that, you know? Um, and I didn't want to leave my family and a whole bunch of other reasons. But um, uh, the directors have been, uh, I mean, I think if, if you have to figure out the way they want to get at something. Um, and if you want, if you want to be a dick about it, you're going to have a lot of problems. So I, and it's, on the other hand, I don't think you just roll over. So it's a, it's a balance. It's a tightrope walk. Um, yeah, I, th I think that people have a hard time understanding about the the job of a screenwriter is obviously we're putting words on the page the same way the novelist is, but there's a whole social aspect to it. You have to be able to read people in the room and and understand what they're actually going after, even before you get to directors. You know, initially with producers and with studio executives, find yeah. out what they're actually really after and what the note is behind the note. And you yeah, know, that's, I mean, that's well said, John. I mean, in other words, it's really trying to read the note behind the note because the, the, the initial note will just annoy you. I mean, in most mm -hmm. cases, you probably thought about it or it'll be uh, I just somebody gave us a note on something recently that they felt there was too much description and I took umbrage at it and said I've been very successful with a lot of subscription but but I got it in other words I think it made it harder for them to read that it was too dense you know in other words once I settled down and uh, and I thought well that's okay you know in other words so you have to be somehow uh, unless they're they're nasty you know and then you don't need to so you know suffer that in any way shape or form but uh, I think you have to be finding a way to be as communal. Look, it's a communal craft, right? Um, yeah. And even though if, uh, I do believe it's a film by as a director's film, when all is said and done, they put all the pieces together. And the the, uh, the architecture, the ship is a, screen, a screenwriter, and you're not going to go on the journey without that. But um, uh, the director has to get it to the right place in the right way. Can you tell me what's in the film industry for screenwriters since you've been doing this job. So how different is it now than, you know, 70s, 80s, your, your early credits? How different is it doing this job or is it not really I don't that feel it's that different, oddly, because I guess maybe I just stay with my process. Um, I, I used to, mm -hmm. I mean, just on a personal level, I used to, I, I had a lot of kids and a lot of little kids and I used to love to just, they would run around and I just write in the living room, you know, I'm saying on a tight mm -hmm. or something. But, uh, um, I don't know because I made, uh, I had a couple oddball little interesting movies made in the seventies, um, that, um, probably would be, you know, interesting today, you know, if there was just streamed, um, mm -hmm. uh, and then I had some big movies. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't know. I think it's, I think eventually it comes down to feeling like the same task to me, but, you know, I'm looking, you know, it's like my dad said, uh, when you, you talk, how's it feel to be 80 or not, whatever he was at the time, he says, you know, I don't look out of those eyes. I don't look at an 80 year old eyes. I look out of whatever eyes I'm, I am, you know, and that's the same thing at 75. Um, I, I'm, I'm quite, this is just a, a kind of sweet, sad thing, but lovely in its own way. I'm very close with David Milch, who I think's, you know, sort of American Shakespeare and from television. And um, David has um, some challenges with some Alzheimer's and, so I went and visited him. I visited him like once a month. And um, he was talking about how time goes so quickly. And I said, it sure does. And I, and I thought to myself, gee, when I was 60, I said, well, I mean, 15 years from now, 75 or 20 from now, that seems like forever. Well, it was a blink. It's a complete blink of the eyes, you know, and now I'm 75. But he also said something else, which was um, pretty, pretty incredible. He said, I said, do you have any regrets? And he said, I wasn't more generous of spirit, which meant he felt that he was been too selfish his whole life. And whether that's true or not, we could, uh, you know, think about, but uh, it made me think, I mean, I think that's an important kind of lesson. I'll put that in something, you know, because that's just uh, something important. Thinking about David Milch and sort of his tremendous success in television, and you said American Shakespeare, and I, I can believe that it's, it's, you know, he was making television at a, this pivotal moment where it became just a dominant American art form in terms of a, a written art form and the writers who created that were so, you know, were so acclaimed and rightfully. Uh, um, it, it's a little frustrating to me. I'm mean, wondering if it's frustrating to you that, you know, we as screenwriters are writing the features that are so iconic and yet there hasn't been sort of the same appreciation that, you know, we sometimes are writing these films that are, um, are known for that. It just, 
if you were to be able to, if you were to go back um, and you know, rewind your career 25 years, would you have still done features and focus on features or would you have been more yeah. attracted to the no, TV? No, no, first of all, I think, you know, I was taught that uh, t- television is smaller than life and that <laughs> movies are bigger than life, you know? So I still look at the 40 foot screen as being important, even though it's irrelevant, yeah. I guess. Um, and I'm not sure I w- I'm as good a short story writer as you have to be, even though I think I've written some good mm-hmm. TV episodes. I wrote one for David that they never aired because it was never shot because of this show getting canceled. I thought it was probably as good a writing as I'd done. But I was just could, I could just be brave because it wasn't my, you know, it wasn't sort of my yeah. memoir. Um, no, I, I grew up with movies. I mean, I, my first experience was watching like uh, War of the Worlds and the Par- Brooklyn Paramount bal- uh, Balcony, you know, and it was like, oh, my God. This is like uh, this is like something that's uh, you know takes me somewhere else. And then I was very big on psychedelics in the '70s and late '60s. And so I like sort of mind expansion stuff that where you can try to go further and, and farther. Um, so I never felt that way about television. I think and I think there's I think the difference is is that you have some incredible writers who are also directors though. So that mm-hmm. and that's sure. a great advantage, you know, because uh, Ingmar Bergman or Fellini. I mean, in other words, you, uh, you could start naming them Antonioni and then Francis, of course. I mean, so these people could then realize what they wrote. So I don't think there's anything better than Godfather 2, probably, that ever, has ever been done. Or to me, 2001, uh, you know, changed my life in some way. But uh, so and Kubrick uh, was able to get that out of his writer, you know, and, and was able to write what he did. So I, um, I think it's, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe there isn't an American Shakespeare in screenwriting. I mean, I, I think part of that's because they're not, you have to be a director maybe to do that. And then um, maybe Chayefsky was, you know, yeah. uh, of a sort. Uh, I, I can't, there's probably a few others, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, and, I mean, Sorkin will be in, in that list, but he's also, yeah, Aaron uh, tremendous wonderful. television stuff that he's done before yeah. this. Um, when he's wonderful, Nor Efren, wonderful when, yeah. uh, I would think, uh, like Bob Fosse, he was pretty amazing. I mean, director, though, but you know, so uh, yeah, I think there's a major advantage to be able to direct it if you're able to be good at being directed. You know, yeah. um, I'm, I'm going to tackle some questions from our list of a growing list of questions here. Um, this one's about adaptations from Mystery Tin. He asks, um, "There's a quote: Don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. How do you negotiate what should be kept in an adaptation and what should be left out when you're adapting?" A true life story. So yeah, it's a great um, question. Uh, really, I love. We yeah. just had this discussion the other night because I watched uh, Trial of the Chicago Seven, and I thought he, Aaron did a really great job. And, and I, I at first kind of had a chip on my shoulders, a little jaundice because I I knew Abby Hoffman quite well, and I knew some of the people, and I had been involved with SD anyway. And then um, it got. I, I'm not sure. If, I have to ask him because I don't know if the, there's a scene at the end of the movie because I think the movie eventually really be, becomes pretty great. And the end, he has a scene where someone gives a speech in the courtroom, and I, I'm going to guess that that was that he wrote a speech that was not uh, what what was there, and so then we got into a debate and uh, about what you can do. I said, well, wait a minute, this is like a historical event, and it's a tr- trial, and then somebody pointed out I had done the same kind of thing and something of my own, and so that. I think I guess your first rule is you're a dramatist, you know. So I'll give you another example. Um, I did a script for Tom Hanks called uh, Garden of the Beast, which is a from a historical book, uh, which was about uh, the, the the American ambassador to Germany during World War II was was kind of a very big Nazi aficionado. Uh, spoke German, had grown, gone to school in Germany, and then he saw kind of the errors of his ways as certain things happened. But um, I dramatized a couple things that Tom objected to. One was that um, I had a scene, I don't think this is a big deal, but Hitler used to watch King Kong like three times a week. And so I had a, I had a scene where he and the ambassador discussing whatever the drama was in the, while, while King Kong was being played. Now that probably didn't happen. Now I don't think that changes the course of it, anything, but I mean, Tom, Tom took me to task for it. And then and then I had Hitler offer him a ride back to the embassy and I had him get in the car with Hitler with all the f- people, you know, on the streets. And I wanted to see what that, how that felt like for any, anybody being inside of that and with flowers all over them. Tom objected to that and he wasn't right or wrong. In other words, so that, I mean, my first job is, I think, as a dramatist so that, and, and you can't, um, we say this actually in, in, uh, in the Mank movie that you can't do somebody's life in two hours. You only can do an impression of it. 
Um, and, and the genius of Citizen Kane is that uh, it's, I think, the first movie that showed, and maybe there's a Russian movie, but that, that showed a character from multiple points of view. That's very rare. In other words, usually mm -hmm. it's from a white, but if you have a wife, you have a her point of view, a child. And, um, so I, I take, uh, uh, the other thing is I usually pick kind of bad books. So, you know, bad books and bad plays make really good movies because one of the reasons is you can just go take off on your own. So you can change things. Uh, I think you have to be careful in certain respects to what what is the what is the sensibilities of people. In other words, I don't think you you just blithely decide to change what somehow is slavery or the Holocaust or I mean, in other words, I think you have to be very careful. Um, so, but I think you have to. I mean, there is a a, a, a criteria that you have to dramatize it if you're a dramatist, and so you're going to combine things and. Uh, um, and this Killer of the Flower Moon is a perfect example because that, that was where I realized that I had done the same thing at the end of the particular courtroom that's the end of the movie. And I, I dramatized something that was not happening there, but I, I wanted to have. So uh, I say go for it, uh, but uh, be a little bit cautious because you will, you can get your ass kicked if you're going to start rewriting history. Mm -hmm. It starts affecting people's, uh, you know, uh, uh, sensitivity. Um, and I, I have never tried to do that, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's, yeah, I think there is a burden. I mean, look, a lot of people don't like Forrest Gump. They think it's a, uh, a poke in the eye at liberalism, all sorts of things. I don't have the same feeling about it. Um, uh, and Bob Zemeckis and I are quite different. He's very, at that time, kind of more a, a universal poke in the eye guy. He didn't give a shit if he made fun of the Black Panthers or Ronald Reagan, you know. And I, I, I was a good staunch. I was born as a red diaper baby and had great communist beliefs that became watered down over the years. But um, uh, so the movie, which criticized probably rightly for peace in some respects, but I think that uh, as Quentin Tarantino said, I think people have lost a sense of irony because the whole thing's supposed to be, it's not supposed to be, it's supposed to be a satire, you know? So, but I think you gotta be careful. I guess my point, um, I think you have to uh, really look for, and, and particularly today, I mean, because people are very aware of their everything heritage, um, what they feel about themselves, I mean, they should, they should. Speaking of Forrest Gump, a good segue into um, a question from JJ. Can you talk about the process of getting hired for adaptations in particular? How do you get started doing adaptation work? So I think it could be, we could talk about Forrest Gump. Obviously, many of your later projects, they came to you with a book and you could say yes or no, but earlier on, there were going to be projects where do you want to do this? Do you want to come in and, and talk to us about this? You're, you're pitching your approach to a book. What are those initial conversations like as you're describing well, good, how you want to take good, an adaptation? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, the good news is, is that, that those were things that were presented to me by like studios, you know, it wasn't anybody else really or a producer. Um, so there was an entity. It wasn't me bringing them a book and trying to, you know, stand on my head and say this will make a great movie. So that was, I think, ahead of the game. Forrest Gump came as a book. I didn't think it was a great book, and the man who wrote it should rest in peace. So uh, he, he gave me something I, you know, it's like a gift. But um, it's a little farcical for me. And then I thought, well, this is a good way to tell the story of this era that I just lived through and time passing, all that stuff. And um, I'm trying to think. The, uh, Benjamin Button was, as I said, a short story. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald was a he just did it for money, he did it for Collier's Magazine and had no, no stake in it at all. Um, so I, I had the uh, sort of permission to go do whatever I wanted with it. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what other books I've done. Um, Munich uh, was a true story. Um, uh, uh, I was rewritten on Munich by Tony Kushner, who I thought did a pretty great job in certain areas. Other areas I, I still resent. But not not him personally. I mean that, which is we could talk about that getting rewritten if you want. That's why I brought it up, because uh, let's talk about let's talk about rewriting because that's a thing yeah. I promised we would get into. So obviously you've come onto projects that were there was already a script and you're coming in there to do work on it, and you've also had projects that you started and then someone else has taken over the the project. So let's start with when you're coming in on an existing project, and there is a script and you're you're talking with folks about stuff. What are those initial conversations and how do you um, how do you treat the, the material that you, you got from the start? Do you, are you treating it like you're treating a book that you're being sent? Like this is the starting place and I'm going to write a new script. Are you trying to incorporate 
as many scenes as are still possible there? Like, what's the decision I process think, for I you? I think it depended on um, what, where they are in the sequence of getting the movie made. Because I, I would never want mm -hmm. to go in and destroy, uh, you know, somebody's uh, having the movie get made. So I'm not as good on, um, uh, I've done some good jobs in more limited basis, you know, where like, on, I thought I did good on Black Hawk Down. Um, mm -hmm. I thought I did some good writing on that. I'll, um, uh, there was a movie called um, that Leonardo and um, uh, Russell Crowe was in that Russell Ridley Scott directed. That uh, is it Blood Diamond? Uh, no, uh, something something of lies or something. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, my point being, uh, I just don't think I did much to help them. You know, and that was mm. they didn't want much, but they I don't think what I did was great. On the other hand, I've come in on things like. Um, let's say Cleopatra, where I started from scratch. There had been a couple scripts before I did, and I and good writers, but I just had a different point of view, and Bundra and Button was another one. And usually if I have the time, and I, I'll, I'll put in the effort and start for over if I, if I think there's a way, or I'll just say I can't be helpful. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's, it, I was more, I think it's this more interesting conversation about not so much the work, but I've rewritten people where it's bruising to other people, and it's and it's it's a not, it's one of the things I don't like about uh, doing it uh, as writers that we scavenge each other, you know, and then they don't have a uh, something I've always spoken to uh, that when you fight for credit and then you if you don't get it you're you're you don't exist in that sense, and you yeah. spend however much time, and I feel the writers guild should change that, but uh, I'm in the minority. I felt like they should have a additional writing credit or something because everybody should at least share in what they did uh, but the writers guild feels um in the main that uh it'll it uh, it, it diminishes the the credit of the of the, of the original of the writers that get credit and then um uh i've had obviously people come in and rewrite me and i've uh i haven't liked it you know i, I said you know you feel like you've been failed you've rejected um um i knew for instance on this movie the horse whisperer uh, I liked Redford very much, but I could tell I lived with him for like two months, three, two, three months. And I realized at one point he was going to look in the mirror and not want to see me there. And so <laughs> and that's what happened. Uh, and uh, uh -huh. and so a good writer, Richard Legrop and Oz came in and did very good work. And I'm, I'm still not wild about the movie, which I don't think had enough adventure in it, but not Richard's fault. But uh, that hurt. I mean, I was, I was wounded by that, you know, and you sort of lick your wounds. And, uh, but I, I guess, uh, I'll give you a funny uh, story because it's about this. I think it's just about rejection, you know, and uh, which uh, every writer feels and from day one. And uh, I asked Warren Beatty the other day, I'm dropping a name here, but have you ever, I don't know why this occurred to me. I said, have you ever been rejected in your whole life? And he said, I think for a long fucking time. And I said, are you <laughs> He said, yeah, I wanted to do like Fistful of Dollars or one of those, you know, Clint Eastwood Westerns. They picked Clint Eastwood and he said, uh, but I got to do Bonnie and Clyde, so it worked out okay. Yeah, it worked, it worked the out. only thing you could think of about rejection, you didn't say, you know, there was a woman who didn't want to go out with me, whatever, you know, no. a man, no. whatever he felt, but that was it. I said, pretty good. I think him and I'm dropping another name. I worked for Mick Jagger on a thing, and um, he's the other one. I thought, this guy never had a moment's rejection in his whole life, you know. Um, we have real time follow up here. So body of lies was the uh, movie you. that you were, you. you were thinking about. Yeah. So we have a, a thousand bad people title. here in, in the bad audience. Title. Bad title to begin with. Not a, not a good title, not a good title. Not Titles are important. They help frame what things oh, are going to be. There have been projects. And names. Yeah, there have been projects that have not taken. Don't you think character names are key too? You know, don't you? I, 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 unless it's a satire or something, if I see a name, here's one of the things I don't like about Dune, right? So. Because I hadn't, I had read Dune when I was like 15, and then I thought it was okay. I wasn't as wild about it like 16 year old boys mostly are. And, um, but then as I went back into it now to do this version for a guy I like very much, who I, I did a good uh, rewrite on the arrive, on Arrival, which I think I did a good job on um, for Denis Villeneuve. Um, so we were, you know, cogitating the whole thing. And there's a character named Duncan Idaho in it. Um, and I said, wait a minute, this is like, the planets are billions of miles away. This isn't a translation of some uh, other language. That's his name. And I said, well, how the hell does that work? You know, but that was a famous character and still will be. Yeah. Uh, so you just don't have characters saying his name aloud very often in, in the movie, hopefully. So that it doesn't, 
It doesn't yeah. doesn't bump people so yeah. much. No, I mean, I, it is fun to do. I think you, if you can get characters that somehow reflect the tone of the movie, like um, I did something today. I called the the villain in this thriller Mr. Lime. And the reason was because that was Orson Welles' name in The, uh, the Third Man. So right. those few who, uh, you know, will know that will, or they'll just think that's a stupid idea, you know. Um, a question here from Allie Kornfeld. She writes, how do people, sorry, she writes, how to learn to trust your own voice when you are a people pleaser by nature and surrounded by smart voices giving you terrific feedback on your scripts? So basically, really a question for you, how do you, um, you've written this thing, you had an approach, you had a point of view, there's a thing you want to do, now you're getting these, these notes back. How do you stay true to your own voice and your, and your own instinct? Uh, when you start getting that I think, feedback, I think you, I think you have to find a different approach to the way you were trying to, and try to hopefully make that similar to what you could then live with to be, uh, you know, that says what you wanted to say. It's difficult because you feel inundated, you know, by um, that there's a sort of a higher power that's looking down and giving you these fiat of notes, and um, and obviously I, I have a, the power more now because I'm more successful. But uh, when I was younger, I, I'm sure I felt kind of uh, a little buffeted by it, but uh, I, I wouldn't, I'm not saying not to stick with your vision, but I think you have to maybe find a way to do your vision differently, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that's probably, I guess, a little more communal in that respect or a little more um, where you can uh, mediate things, you know, I think, because uh, it's not black and white, I guess. And um, uh, I think you, and sometimes you're surprised at the, and, and what happens, I mean, eventually, which is kind of funny is that you, you know, you stake your claim on something and you really, you know, stick your sword in the ground and you're not going to move. And then you slowly move and eventually it's gone and then it becomes gone and you don't remember you even were involved with it, you know, in that, it, that scene, you know, just goes into the, some boy in the ether. So uh, I, I think, uh, I think you have to be brave in a way. Um, be brave without being stupid, I guess, you know. Um, and Always a good combination. Um, I'm going to combine a couple questions here. People are asking about writing for an actor or writing with an actor in mind. Do you prefer, you know, writing something where you know who's going to be playing that role, or would you rather have it be blank as your story? Um, I think there's an advantage to both. Um, I, I, uh, um, in my, many cases, I've known who the actor was, so that that was easier. Like Tom Hanks for Forrest Gump was a dream. Um, uh, Brad Pitt with. Benjamin Button, so I knew what, what he could possibly do or not do. Um, I was a little more uh, taken uh, with in The Insider that Russell Crowe, when he was hired, I already written a part, and the part was very difficult because I couldn't interview the real guy. So I had to go on basically what was, who's a guy? I mean, I tried to then develop a character, which is what you could always do. You say, well, mm -hmm. who's this man who is a scientist for tobacco companies? And what does that say? Is he wants to be a big fish in a little pond of scientists or he you know is insecure about his science science knowledge or he want in this case he actually really just wanted to get his pension but um so i wrote what was i think a full-blooded character and then russell came on and russell had a lot of questions and um i mean i can't tell you the number of times i had to get on an airplane and go down there because michael Mann didn't want to fight with him and mm. he didn't want us to have that kind of relationship so i would go and say because russell wouldn't come out of his trailer and i he said, well, what's going on? He said, I don't get this. I don't fucking get it. You know, and so I said, we let the, you know, you go through it and you hopefully convince him that this is the way that it should be. And then you make some accommodations. Worth. The things on that movie I'll never forget is that Al Pacino called me one morning and he said, you have a three page monologue here. I could do it in one look. I said, if you can do it in one look, do it. And he did. He did. That's good. Yeah. That's good. So, good. It, it, it saved, saved some camera. It saved some real... And he really did. He really did. You know. Eric, what's been your experience? Because I've had the same thing with, with actors who are um, incredibly challenging to deal with and over dealing things on, on, on scripts and stories. And it's, I'm, o I'm always wrestling with to what degree are they being reasonable, but like they can't connect these dots either intellectually or emotionally. They can't make it work. And to what degree is it's insecurity? How you know, with the Russell Crowe or with other actors you've dealt with, how do you think a writer sh can or should interact with actors who are, you know, doing that thing? It could be on 
uh, an independent film, a small independent film set that our, right, our people right, are, sure. are working on, or a giant mega budget picture. I mean, I, I think, what what works? I mean, I think I think rehearsals are really important and read throughs because I think you get a sense of what they can do or can't do or where there's going to be bumps. And I like for every movie I've written, I think I I, I go to the set because I've anticipated what's going to be a scene that's going to be a problem, mm. or I'll go to watch what I enjoyed. But um, uh, I think you. Uh, um, I think you have to uh, befriend the actor in a good way, even, even if they're a dick, you know, and, and try to find a way mm -hmm. so you understand their psychology. I mean, I'm, I'm going to do it, and he's a nice person, so I'm going to do a movie in the future with Joaquin Phoenix, which is a really tough subject matter, but he, he works very differently, you know, and he really yeah. wants to, you know, get into the weeds and the emotions and the things, and like, he doesn't rehearse at all. He doesn't like rehearsals, but... Um, I've already established a relationship with him. I think we intellectually can understand what we both want from it. But he'll trust me to some extent and I'll trust him. And I, some of that's just having the experience of having done it so, for so long, so that I, you know, it's because I work with so many people. But I remember uh, as a young boy, uh, and I was literally 19 years old, walking on the set of uh, The Drowning Pool, same Stuart Rosenberg had directed, and Paul Newman was a star. And, they needed to rewrite and I came with my new pair of corduroys and my nice new briefcase and walked on the set and Paul Newman said, our savior's here. <laughs> and I said, well, good luck to him, you know, me and him. And uh, I don't know, they accepted me then. I guess I'm, I'm amenable. I don't, I mean, I don't kiss ass particularly, but uh, I think that, you know, if you, I think it's, it is a team effort of a kind, you know, so uh, if you can be uh, uh, smart about the way, I mean, I don't think there's any one way to do it, but I think part of it's just your own personal skills with people. As you're talking about this 19 year old you walking onto the set, if you could give advice to that 19 year old you, obviously he made some really good choices along the way, but are there any other pieces of advice you wish you could you know, whisper to that 19 year old? I think writing wise, I wish I could, I, I wish I had, um, I wish I could be a little more concise. Mm. Um, I think I tend to write, overwrite, I think because I'm a frustrated novelist, you know? Um, and so I write these long prose things and I, I think it's, I think it's probably gets in the way of things. Um, so if I could articulate things a little more articulately in a, a smaller way, um, uh, I probably, um, I don't know. I think, uh, I can't think of too many movies that I missed, that, uh, you know, in other words, that I was offered and I said, no, there's a couple, you know, um, the biggest one for me was I was offered to do Cuckoo's Nest originally yeah. and I was doing the onion field and, um, my agent said, they'll never make that movie. And then literally like a week later, Jack Nicholson <laughs> signed to do it, you know? And, um, I did come back and I rewrote um, the uh, fishing boat scene because so I was good friends at that time with Michael Douglas. And, um, but that was, the, that was the only one I think that I said, wow, you know, but I don't know, Bo Goldman who wrote it, uh, even though he re rewrote somebody named guy named Larry Halbin, who just out of the blue decided to write a script from it because it was owned by somebody. Uh, but Bo Goldman, I think maybe one of the better uh, uh, screenwriters who ever lived. I mean, he did Harold and uh, Howard, Howard Melvin and he did, uh, the best uh, divorce movie, Shoot the Moon, I think. I haven't seen it in so long. And and he did, um, uh, what else did he do? I mean, he did some really incredible movies. Uh, Cuckoo's Nest. And, uh, and right. so, so you're going to whisper to him, like, do Cuckoo's Nest, but basically do everything else. Just follow your instincts because it, it'll serve you very, very well. But look, I don't think everybody has that uh, leisure. They, they, they have to yeah. work, you know, so yeah. that you don't get to always do... I think what you need to do though is try to do, and I'll give you a funny example of this. So I, when I, I had no money and I really needed work and I did airport 79, the Concord. And I, I and, and I wrote a very wonderful line called, they don't call it the cockpit for nothing. Anyhow, um, uh, I tried to write, I mean, this is arrogance in a way, but I tried to write the best disaster movie. That's what they called those then ever made, you know? So, and actually I got sort of a half kudos for it. Uh, the, the critic for the New York Times says, this is either the worst disaster movie ever made or the best. <laughs> so, but I did try to make that something special for me. You know, I, I put in like uh, Saint Ixabri, you know, Exbrupri about flying. I had some <laughs> El Delon reading poetry, you know, it was like ridiculous, you know. But uh, I think you have to believe in what you're doing and hopefully that you, you make the best of it. All right. 
Eric, uh, thank you for making the best of it for all these oh. amazing movies you've done. And thank you for this conversation. I want to thank the Writers Guild Foundation for having us both here. Uh, so they do amazing work throughout yeah, the year. Amazing. So these, th these, these panels are, are great fun, but all the outreach they do to developing writers and other folks is remarkable. So please yeah. do support the Writers Guild Foundation. Yeah. Thank you, Dustin, for putting this together. Um, thank you. Eric, thank you so much. It was great, you. great to chat. I, I love meeting you this way. That's yeah, nice. Wonderful. Really cool. nice. So, thank you all. Uh, see you at the movies. Not really. See you on the screen, a uh, television screen. Thank you. And, and, and when do we see Mank? Mank is uh, Mank next will be, month. Uh, I'm not, I mean, I'm not, I think like late November, early December, maybe. Um, Dune will be next okay. year. Um, and Killers of the Flower Moon the year after, maybe. But uh, yeah, Mank, I want everybody to look at. I think you'll find it pretty special. And it's about screen. Exactly. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Bye.